Hello, I'm Josephine Burton and welcome back to the Dash Arts podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. So this autumn, we're finally opening up. Dash Arts is working on some new productions and we thought we'd explore them through our podcast series with our podcast producer, Rachel Head, as our guide. Rachel, how does it feel to step in front of the microphone and be our host for the series? (laughs) A little bit odd, if I'm honest. Normally, I've got my uh, I've got my notepad. I'm on mute. I've got my cup of coffee. Uh, no, it's been a real pleasure and kind of a joy to be able to ask my own questions and for you and I to be able to sit down and talk um, about the show, about Dido's Bar. And hey, if I can do half as good a job as you do, I hope the listeners will be happy with that. <laughs> Oh, you flatter me. I've really loved listening to your questions, but I also have loved, I've loved your insights and, and particularly hearing, um, hearing the way that you talk about it because you spent some time with Dido's Bar in the rehearsal room um, last year. So you're actually quite already intimately quite familiar with the work. So it's lovely for, I suppose it must be quite fascinating for you to, to be able to talk to people about how it's been since you, you were last in the rehearsal room. Yeah, it is different. And I do feel like I have a sort of connection with the show in that respect. Um But it is really different and it has developed and evolved. Well, since last December when we were sat in a room and with partitions on two metre socially distant spots away from each other. And now it is really brilliant to be able to talk to yourself and Maroof and Hattie in a slightly later episode about where the project has got to. Uh, But we are getting ahead of ourselves slightly because this episode is more of an origin episode it's more focusing on the myth it's focusing on maroof and the the story of of yourself and maroof creating this work together i will leave you to it thank you for leading us on the on the way to kick this episode off let's jump straight into a conversation that you and i had about dido's bar where i sort of started by asking you quite a big question which is tell me as the artistic director of dash arts why this is a project you wanted to do and how it started for you. Adesh, the intention has always been that alongside a big journey of of research and development, there will be a new piece of performance that will emerge through the exploration and the journey. And when I set off on our kind of initial foray with this project Utopia, um, that was always the intention. I just didn't know what it would be. I loved the fact that we always go off to ask lots of questions, lots of whys. And after the Brexit referendum, which we talked a little bit about in in the, the last podcast, it took a little bit of time for that, for those questions to sort of settle. I guess it took probably about a year uh, through for after the referendum. But by the early part of 2017, uh, it was very clear that that was going to be the next big question, understanding what it meant to be European. So over the course of, a, of 2017, I started to have conversations with artists and creatives and people making work from across Europe, largely in the UK. And one of those people was a lovely woman at the Finnish Institute in London. And she said, well, you should come to Finland and come and see what's going on in Helsinki. And she invited me to the Baltic Circle Circle Festival, which was this annual avant-garde performance festival, which brings in international artists to Helsinki. And I went along and I saw some fantastic work. And in fact, one of the brilliant um, performers, this wonderful Sami singer, Hilda Lundsman, uh, was performing as part of that festival and uh, I brought her over to London as part of our Dash Cafe series a, a year later. So I made some fantastic connections generally at the festival. And when I was there, I contacted some friends I know through the music scene and said, while I'm here for this theatre festival, who should I go and talk to who's interesting musically? If I had like an hour to meet some interesting musicians in Helsinki, who would they be? And one of those people was Maruf, who I called. And Maruf said, yeah, sure, I'll meet you tomorrow. I said, it's got to be this time I'm on my, I'm on my way to the airport so we had a very short coffee Maruf and I and uh, I think they told me that Maruf was originally from Iran and um, we had this sort of kind of quite thoughtful conversation where he told me that he'd felt out of tune with the musicians when he arrived in Finland and he hadn't quite ever found his place he always felt that he'd been separate from them in some way like he'd always been the soloist and not part of the ensemble and he said it happened for about four or five years. And then something something gave and he found his voice and he found his place and sort of established himself and assimilated into the musical world of Finland. But then he said when he went back to Central Asia, he, he no longer felt in tune with the musicians he 
played with from back there. And I, I said, what do you mean out of tune? Do you mean you were literally out of tune? Or are you saying there was some sort of psychological reason why you hadn't quite gelled? He couldn't quite explain to me. Like he was like, it's a little bit of both. And it was just a, maybe a couple of minutes of a conversation, but it absolutely planted a seed for me uh, as a, of a question. And that kind of, that conversation lived with me for quite a long time afterwards. So I returned back to London and carried on thinking about what I wanted to do with this project, a utopia. And, and I couldn't get this idea of being out of tune, out of my mind. And I started to think, well, perhaps it's Maruf's insight into there being a different sound in Europe to the sound from which he came. That can help me unlock this question of what it means to be European. So if, if perhaps like if, if, if Maruf has found something that is quite distinct from what he had before, then there is maybe a sound, a culture, a world um, that's different in Europe than, from, than elsewhere. And what is it? And can he help me understand it? Because perhaps there's an answer because I, I felt like I didn't really understand. I, I've never really understood it. Perhaps like I'm a native European, I've never really needed to question what it is to be European. But perhaps it's the people who come here and find it uh, can help us understand ourselves. So that was the sort of the prompt. And, 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 and I returned to Maruf and said, so I've got this idea and can you help me make a piece of theatre or, or a show with it? And I didn't, I didn't just want to kind of create this sort of super band of great musicians uh, from across Europe who perhaps are amazing refugees or migrants uh, uh, who've come here. It just didn't feel quite enough to, to create a musical project. It felt like I really wanted to interrogate this question at the heart of it. And therefore, I needed to find a story. And Maruf's story is extraordinary. I wanted to find a way of, 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 of keeping Maruf's story at the heart of it, but not, not making it necessarily about him per se, but making it about um, this question, this search for what it means to be European. So you didn't find the myth, you found Maruf and realised that you wanted to make a show about him. So what was it about Maruf that inspired you so much? It was absolutely about finding Maruf. He's at the heart of the piece. He grew up as a Kurdish uh, Iranian. He went to study music at the Conservatoire in Tehran. He learnt Persian classical music. He fled uh, Iran politically. He lived in Ankara, where he sought asylum with the UNHCR. He uh, spent time in southern Turkey. He was relocated uh, by a kind of flip of a coin because he was going to go to Norway and then the Norwegians decided they didn't want him or didn't want them. And then he ended up being relocated to northern Finland. So he's just been on this amazing journey of sort of Kurdish folk music, Persian classical music, <laughs> Finnish folk music. He studied Turkish music as well. So he's incredibly versatile, but the musical worlds that he's been through on his journey were so inspiring. So it, he, it is Maruf's story, but of course it's not just Maruf's story. It's also the story of the many, many refugees that have made their way to Europe over the years. And I wanted, so I wanted Maruf's story to it to be his story, but also that sense of being out of tune, in tune, finding the tune. I wanted to, to, to find a universal way of, 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 of um, marking and paying tribute to all the many people who've, who've made their lives in Europe. And I didn't have the myth at that point. It was only, I would say, in late sort of middle of 2019, so nearly two years after I met Maruf, of talking about how we were going to tell this story and what it was going to be and were we going to bring a crits band. It was then that I remembered the story of the Aeneid and I thought, this is the story that will, that will enable me to tell Maruf's story. Amazing. I guess that's my next question, actually. For you, how does the Aeneid and the story of Aeneas and Dido fit into that search for what it means to be European? The story at the heart of the of the Aeneid is quite complicated because it's both this kind of incredible myth of uh, a refugee from Troy who flees Troy and goes across on a, a sea voyage which is quite turbulent and potentially lasts about six years of all sorts of challenges and tragedies um, and eventually finds themselves in uh, Western Europe where they arrive and they have to settle and it's not a sort of deserted land, it's populated. This refugee not only has to sort of assimilate with the culture they encounter as they land, but actually in the in the story, this this hero becomes the sort of ancestor of what becomes the Roman Empire. And um, so it's a sort of a, it's an amazing story. But actually, it's written. Um, there's a whole other layer to the text, which is that it's not it's a, it's not like an oral story. It is written by a poet. Um, it's a political story that, in some ways, links the Emperor Augustus with this old myth from Troy. So there's a whole layer to this text, which is so artificial. 
It's trying to be this old myth, but it's an absolute re- contemporary rewrite, almost Trumpian in its way of retelling history in order to in order to make sense of the present. And so, what I've tried to do with with the whole process of adapting the Aeneid is to sort of strip it back to really work out what, at its essence, is this story about. And I suppose the story is a refugee who finds themselves in a, in a land in Western Europe where they have to settle and thrive. And it was that story that was Maruf's story. Before jumping into the myth and the wonderful speakers on the Aeneid, I wanted to go back to the origins of the show. Josephine told me some incredible things about Maruf's background, but I wanted to ask him himself what it was like. So Josephine and I sat down with him. Maruf, thank you so, so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. I know you're incredibly busy. I want to start by asking about your move to Finland and the feelings that led to the inspiration behind the show. My move to Helsinki goes back to almost 20 years ago and uh, it was a consequence of uh, many things that happened in my life which uh, forced me to move outside of Iran and so for a while I have to live in a couple of different places uh, until I reached Helsinki. So you arrive in Helsinki and as a musician, what's your first move? Who do you reach out to? I mean, first I actually moved to Tampere, is a city couple of hours from uh, from Helsinki in Tampere University they have a faculty of uh, ethnomusicology and so I went there I introduced myself who I am what I have done and uh, in that time they had the biggest or second biggest uh, music archive in the country so they took me there they asked me hey you know we have all this old vinyls and albums and cities and stuff and uh, you know there's also many things from middle east do you want to be part of this help us to understand more of this music translate some stuff so i quite quickly actually jumped in that you know doing that and uh, very soon i find out through some people that in finland you can study folk music which is very rare from where I'm coming. Actually, it's very rare from your, where you are coming also. There's not many countries in the world where you can study folk music. So you're in Helsinki. You've been able to study folk music, which is amazing. Uh, tell me about your first meeting with Josephine. Actually, this is the interesting one. We met in the center in a, in a coffee shop. We had this uh, very short meeting, which actually, I mean, for me, she didn't sound like that she had a questions or she had ideas. we were just talking i also told her a little bit about my journey how i i had got outside of iran how i got into europe how, how i came into finland and how i did feel you know how i felt at the beginning i felt outsider you know the feeling of being out of tune for many years i felt that you know that i'm not really in tune with the co-musicians you know whatever i played and it was not I felt that the music, you know, is not clicked there, you know, even though I know how to compose, how to write music. But anyway, I had this feeling for some years and after five, six, seven years, I really felt that, okay, now it's clicked, you know, now things are going on and I feel that, you know, it's there. And after many years, I had a chance to travel to Middle East and then I... I actually didn't go to Iran. I was in those countries around Iran. I got to play with many musicians, but with them I felt out of tune, you know. I was going to these small villages with many people who were playing the tunes. They were Iranian, Persian, Kurdish, Azeri tunes from my childhood. I know them like my palms. But when I was playing with them, I felt really out of tune again with them. So it was not clicking, you know, there was no this flow. There was a... I don't know, a moment of uh, confusion, you know, what's going on, you know, now I was out of tune there. Now I'm coming back to where I'm coming from, you know, to my, basically to my roots. And I feel out of tune again. So I told this story more or less same, you know, a bit, maybe a bit longer. And Josephine, when you asked for people to meet and you got in touch with Maruf, what were you hoping to happen? Were you looking for someone to work with or was it just on the off chance? 
It's a great question. I, I, I think it, it's partly about the uh, the process that I go through at Dash, so that I really I'm, I go so I, I arrive at the beginning of these kind of research journeys completely open to whatever it is that I might encounter. So I, I don't think I, I certainly wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to go and meet somebody with whom I'm going to make a new show. It was simply that I'd 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 asked somebody in in um, Helsinki who would you who would you recommend? Who are the great musicians that I should meet? I'm here for a theatre festival, but I don't just make theatre. Uh, who would you recommend that I contact while I'm here for like my very short visit? And Maruf was top of the list of the you know, musicians that I should meet. And so I just went along curious and interested. And uh, and as, as Maruf said, that, that little conversation, that little kernel of an idea just stayed with me. And slowly it just sort of came to be the case that this was this was the same I kind of slowly I came to a realization that this was the this was the story that I wanted to tell this is the story of Europe but it it didn't it was an incremental awakening it certainly wasn't a kind of kind of sudden moment in the room in that funny Finnish coffees and I have to say Finns don't the Finns love coffee but the coffee's not very strong so I don't like I don't think it was like a it wasn't like an adrenaline buzz that came to me at that moment. Maruf what's the next step there? Josephine gets back in touch and says let's make something um What's the process? How long did it take you to land on the kind of show you guys wanted to make together? And how collaborative was that? And also, big question, um, also how much of yourself do you think that you put into it? Was it all personal for you? The idea was quite clear what she proposed. At the beginning, it was just a line, you know, okay, this is this out of tune, the story of uh, immigration, you know, and being in one place and uh, feeling out of tune. And I was thinking, you know, about, uh, how it, it can sound, how big could be, what is the instrumentation. It was just ideas at the beginning. And uh, I must say, Josephine, as a great gift, threw also the ideas. So she was just throwing different ideas and we were kind of uh, giving the space to those ideas to grow. So I was not like, okay, we have this timetable and we should do this in uh, one year or something. Josephine brought the idea of uh, an aid of Virgil. It got into the next uh, step, the whole project. <laughs> Amazing. And was it an obvious fit for you when Josephine suggested the Aeneid? Or was it more of a question mark on how you're going to be able to tell that story through that lens? I have worked with the epics, uh, with uh, Gilgamesh and Shahname and Kalevala before. So I had uh, a kind of idea. I think uh, Josephine also agrees that uh, we had uh, this session in, uh, in Scotland, uh, this residency. That uh, residency was the turning point for me because the first days I were really like, oh my God, what's going on? What is this, you know? And of course, the, the main thing was the English language and this this old uh, kind of English that, you know, was in those books, in the Virgil book. And But I think that was, as I, as I said, that was a, a turning point. That residency, after that, things got much, much more clear, you know, so regarded to the to the NAID and also regarded to the project and also regarded to how I can contribute, you know, what is my role, what, what we're going to do. There was something else that I, for me, was a really important part of the process, Marif, which was those few days that I spent living in your home in Helsinki after Womex, in, just before the residency, in, in the end of 2019, when we talked about the story and I shared with you what I understood about the Virgil's story, and then you you shared me your story, which, you know, we'd met maybe two years earlier. But you get to know people as a person, you get to know them through layers and layers. And that story of your, your own personal journey to Finland, it's a long story. And it's also very personal to you. And it took a long time for our relationship to get to the point of you being able to share it with me, I think. I remember that time of us looking at the parallels between the Aeneas' journey journey to Europe and your own journey to Europe and getting quite excited about finding ways to retell both of those stories together. I definitely I definitely remember, you know, and I remember the process maybe more because, uh, you know, I, as I said, you know, I had also a hard time to, you know, get into the, this uh, Virgil's story. But I think the conversation that we had, you know, uh, first by me telling my story, you know, and then you telling, like kind of retelling my story and, uh, you know, also bringing the Virgil's story. I think that helped me a lot to to understand also my story and this project's, you know, better. 
This film outcast, I lay my soul in yours. Liv Albert is the much loved host of one of the world's biggest podcasts on mythology. Let's talk about myths, baby. In addition to this, she's now also a best selling author. She's known for her intersectional feminist take on the classics, so I went to her for her thoughts on the Aeneid. I basically was interested in, in what your version, what you're retelling um, briefly for, for listeners of the Aeneid would, would be. Absolute basics of it are Aeneas escapes from Troy uh, and goes through all of these trials on the way, but we don't really hear about them. Like what I find interesting about that is it's meant to mirror the Odyssey, but also they skip over a lot of it. Like Virgil is just kind of like, oh, they encountered this, this and this, but we won't talk about it. Or they sailed by all of these dangerous things and avoided them because they're great. And and then, you know, they land on Carthage and that's sort of where all of the the horror starts when it comes to Dido, but she is such a small part of it um, that it's so interesting to me because I think she is vitally important, but she's in like three books. You know, I think by book five, they're gone. You know, they're they're off sailing towards Italy and then all of the Aeneid retelling of the Iliad commences and, and all of the war and everything there. Um, that's a horrible uh, summation of the Aeneid. You know, you get past what, book five? And it's just like, and then they fought... And then they fought some more. <laughs> Talk to me about Dido. It must be only book two, even maybe book one. Um, Aeneas lands in Carthage and he like gets himself disguised by um, Aphrodite, his mother Venus, rather, um, working for him. And he comes in like completely invisible and basically like spies on Dido and everything she's doing without anyone being able to see him. And then it does this big reveal like while they're talking about him. And it's just so interesting to me for that. I mean, it's also just straight entertaining. And he's like, you know, takes off his invisibility and he's like, hi, I'm here. Like, I'm your savior, not really, like not literally, but I'm kind of here to change your life and you'll think it's good. And then you know, spoilers, it's really bad. Um, but so, you know, Aeneas lands there, speaks with Dido. She is given a sort of love spell immediately and then falls completely for him. And then we get this idea. It's sort of unclear, depending on who you read about it, let alone in the work itself, that like they have this kind of whirlwind romance. And I think the idea is to present them as if they have been together like a while at least, you know, a few months or something. And because eventually Aeneas is, you know, he's thinking of staying and he's told by the gods, like he has to know, he has to go on and found Italy, like the world won't continue on if he doesn't. And so he leaves. And, you know, a lot of people interpret this as like Aeneas having this really tough decision to make and that he leaves Dido with all this apprehension and that he's really sad and he's really sorry for leaving her. And, you know, they give Aeneas a lot of the benefit of the doubt that he does this because he has to because fate has said he has to and that's the only reason meanwhile i you know i think it's somewhat clear in the text that he's pretty cool with leaving he's just kind of like okay see you later dido like it's been nice um i'm gone and and then instead we have this idea of dido making it this whole big dramatic thing and you know she throws herself on both a sword and a funeral pyre and he watches you know and sees the smoke and knows it's happened. And it's just interesting the the way different people read into it. Like I do not find Aeneas to be a sympathetic character. So I'll admit my reading of him is totally biased on that. Like I don't like him. I think he's obnoxious. Um, and I do like Dido and I think she's important. So obviously like my reading is entirely based around that. But to me, it's pretty clear that like Aeneas was fine to leave. He knew it was important, sure. But also he was just kind of like, yeah, I, I, you know, it's run my course here. I love her, but I'm done and I'll find another woman in Italy and life will go on. And then versus Dido, who is under this love spell. And so life will not go on because she has like, been convinced by the gods. She's been changed by the gods to love this man. So she can't live without him, even though he can live without her. And to me... Uh, you know, as a, from a story perspective, Dido is super important because, I mean, she represents so much, you know, she is a 
queen of a major player in the Mediterranean, like an incredibly important civilization. Oh, I hate using that word. It's a, a, an incredibly important group of people, the Carthaginians in the Mediterranean, and she is their queen, you know, and, and that alone is so important and rare. But then to have her be completely taken down by both Aeneas and the machinations of the gods. You know, she she reminds me of Medea. You know, a god makes her fall in love with this man and then her life is defined by it through abject tragedy. And, you know, she didn't fall in love with him by choice. And so many things happen in that kind of realm that I just think she's an incredibly powerful character, but also because of the way that she is affected by those around her, like not by her own will. You know, and then Aeneas's reaction to her is its own other mess of ridiculous men of classical works. Um, but then completely separately from that, you have Dido as a symbol of Carthage in the time when this book was being written. You know, so I think she's really fascinating from this mythological standpoint, from this, you know, this idea that Aeneas was this character, you know, probably Bronze Age, you know, same time as the Trojan War and goes on to found the varied cities that would then eventually lead to Rome. Um, but then from a standpoint of when the Aeneid was actually being written, they're coming at it talking about these people, the Carthaginians, who they have destroyed. I'm going to get my Roman history not 100% correctly, but as far, as far as I remember, by the time they're writing this, Carthage has already been completely destroyed by Rome. You know, they had three separate wars with Carthage, the, and then in the last one, Rome won. They completely burned you know, burn the city to to dust. The myths say they salted the earth. Like, you know, they went so hard to completely, completely take out Carthage. And then Virgil comes along and writes this story where this iconic mythical founder of their city not only stops in Carthage, their biggest enemy, but, you know, causes the death of their queen, their mythological founder. Like he essentially you know, Dido is the equivalent of Aeneas for Carthage. And they they write in this part of his story where he just causes her death. It's a fascinating thing to me from a historical standpoint, in addition to a mythological one. We're looking at the Aeneid through the lens of immigration. Do you think that the story lends itself to that telling, to that sort of reframing? I wonder. I mean, I do think that it's an important message in it that's often not really emphasized. Um, because, I mean, they're literally refugees from war, right? The idea, and then I think Rome really wanted to emphasize that as well, in whatever way that, you know, sort of affects their mythological history, that not only are they refugees from war, but they're refugees from the war waged by the Greeks against the Trojans. And the Trojans, the Trojans come out, you know, pretty good in the Iliad. You know, you, you, you read the Iliad, and I think if you've never, you know, fully read the story before, you kind of go in thinking like, well, this is like the Greek epic, so we're going to get, you know, the heroic Greeks. And then you get the heroic Greeks, but what you really get is like an idea of just how shitty the Greeks handled it. Like, you know, I come out of the Iliad, like, I love Greek mythology and the Greeks and everything. I come out of the Iliad being like, oh, Hector, you were done dirty, you know? And so I think Rome really played on that. They were like, okay, like, you know, you read the Iliad and you love the Trojans. So let's pull our mythological history from these tragic figures of Trojan refugees, these people who are just trying to save their their culture and their world. And they, you know, they flee and they travel so far in order to to get to Italy where they'll then found Rome. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's generally very interesting. And then if you layer on the fact that Dido was the same, but she doesn't get any of the same sympathy. I think that's interesting because Rome was clearly like, you know, trying to raise their own refugee status, but did not care that Carthaginians could be considered as such as well, you know? So I think it's, it's an interesting commentary on the plight of refugees, but only the ones you want to care about, not all of them. <laughs> One of the big challenges for me about this extraordinary story is, although at its essence it is the story of, of, a, of a, a refugee who comes from the East and needs to find their place 
in the West and has this great love affair with Dido on the way. And the big sticking point for me about this book, particularly when I reread it, was the second half of these 12 books. It's largely all fighting. Sort of Aeneas shows up in, in Italy discovers it's entirely inhabited and there is this guy called Turnus who is the sort of king in waiting and he's got to get rid of Turnus in order to become the king of Italy and he largely spends six books but fighting him I mean there's moments of beauty in those six books but largely it's just a whole lot of battles and a whole lot of death and I thought well okay so we're gonna have to really rethink what we're trying to do with Aeneas and Turnus and be true to Maruf as well in this in the in the telling of that story so I think it was in Scotland in that in those few days that we ended up saying okay well can we retell this story in a world that's more familiar to us? It's not a war of battles and epic fighting. Can we retell this story in a different way? And, and it was obvious quite fast that Maruf's story as a musician needed to be at the heart of our, telling, our retelling of Aeneas. So Aeneas became, through those few days, uh, the last surviving musician and storyteller of this city of Troy. As he fled the city alone largely alone he he was not only kind of carrying on to the history of his town but he was carrying the stop the songs and the stories and the cultural history and it was that that was compelling him to continue to find a place in the west where he would actually be able to carry um the stories and the music of his destroyed homeland so if he's a musician and he's got to make it in the west as an artist all the people that he meets in the West need to be in that world. So we immediately thought, well, we've got to relocate the story into a musical world. So Turnus, who's the great anti-hero in the original story, is himself also a musician. So Aeneas has got to replace him in the band. And slowly this sort of reframing of this old story and the parallels, you know, who are the gods? How do we how do we retell gods in a creative way that makes sense to us today? Let's make the gods the owners of the bar. So like they pull all the strings. They own the bands they own the bar the music scene is theirs and they've got to be like pro and anti the hero we spent a lot of time just saying well let's retell this story in a way that's familiar to us in our scene and music was obviously the what was going to drive us because Maruf himself is a musician so you've spent some time making the show and you know what the idea of the show is going to be and then you got to do this residency in scotland um tell me a little bit about that what was the process of it and who did you take up there how did you guys work together so we brought we we brought with us to to Scotland a lot. Maruf and I were we we we'd received a little bit of funding, and we knew really at that point that we wanted to do more work. It was very clear that like our few days together on the text, thinking about the overlaps of these stories, just needed to get deeper, and we needed to bring in some. We we'd already knew we were going to Finland to the residency. We thought in summer twenty twenty, so we needed to do some more work, and so we we invited uh, the the playwright Chino Adimba. And um, the actor Amar Haj um, Ahmed to join us in um, in in as for four three I think it was they they came for two days and then Marif and I spent some days either side of that part together up in this amazing place just in the Highlands in the, in this artistic residency you play space and it was the dead of winter and the the rain kept sweeping in and I've been thinking about it because uh, it. It's where the Trident lives, and I've been watching Vigil on radio on on BBC One, thinking about the submarines because we saw them quite often making their way. The ones that I guess aren't out on patrol, uh, we saw them making their way quite regularly up and down the loch. It was kind of phenomenal and dark. Do you remember that, Marif, the seeing the submarines? I remember. Yes. And when did you bring in the music? I don't think we had any music those few days at all did we we set up some music and maybe I think Chino Chino played a little bit with you we did a bit of music and storytelling but uh we just talked we just read I I I just remember sitting there with and it was before before Shadi's book had come out so we actually didn't the reason why the English was so difficult was because it was a really old-fashioned translation we had at that point in the room so we had the English translation some Latin some Farsi and some Arabic and we just made our way through the books just read them all this epic story and told each other the stories and and made like drew posters all over the walls i've got pictures of i've still got these vast sheets of like book two the key things that happened in book two it was really like 
heavy detailed work and it was that was for me as a like, native english speaker working in english i mean i can't as you may have said it is that i didn't even have to get over this kind of huge hurdle of working in my what uh, english is like your fourth language maruf is it third language yes it is and it was it was funny i remember we we got into the point with josephine and some if you remember josephine that we we had this uh, kind of marathons of Okay, let's now tell the, uh, the story in 30 seconds. Let's now tell the story in one minute. So we have this, if you remember, so we had this like, uh, okay, now you have one minute and you should tell the, the whole, this uh, an AIDS book in one minute. Can you summarize this? You know, and so we, we really went through this book a lot and and I'm not sure if I really understood even after those you know heavy heavy duty sessions there was I maybe couple of months three four months after that was the feeling that okay now I understand that book you know because there the yeah the amount of information was just yeah unbelievable and i do remember those moments of going okay 30 seconds let's do the start watch tell the story i mean we were, i was trying to like get us to strip away from the war and strip away from like all of the stuff that's you know these great kind of gods and battles to, to really what was the essence of the story that was relevant and interesting to to our version of retelling the story of searching for a tune uh, so it was really a, a little fun exercise but i remember that one i also remember speaking to shadi one day we, we had a connection with her and it's really lovely that you're, we're speaking to her for this podcast because we did call her up and we, yes. I remember trying to say, what's the difference between like the gods and the fates? And there were always kind of questions that had come up for us that we asked her in the room, which was really quite fun. Yeah. I can't wait to talk to her. Um, let's skip forward a little bit. So you have the show, you know, it's a musical. How do you start the composing process for something like this? Usually... Let's put it in usually, I mean, there's many ways to compose things, you know. You can compose from uh, nothing, and you can compose from idea, or compose from a, a ready-made something. So, I think we, in this project, we have had all the different approach, kind of, so far. So, we have... We have had this moment that we sitting down, you know, open the book and try to make something out of it, you know, like a musically sing it, make melodies out of it, use something traditional melody, do it or no, you know, approach the the text with the with instrumentation, instrumental things or or no, uh, bring a piece of music and then put the text on of it. I think we have a uh, explored uh, many different different approaches and uh, what I have uh, personally understood that uh, actually in this project all all of the approaches are right you know because uh, it has this has been uh, the, as the very central uh, thing of this project has been the uh, collectiveness so it has been a very collective uh, project now now lately that we have this residency in uh, Maidan Festival in Helsinki this summer a couple of months ago you know we basically were doing the same you know we were in the same room you know okay getting inputs from the okay the, there's coming something let's make a music for it oh that sound like this what about this what you know so i think uh this been a very fruitful in that sense that uh and at the same time very challenging this is not the easy way because sometimes uh for the composer it's the it's the much easier that you know you have your own space they give you the the text or the idea or whatever and you compose for that you know that's it's in a way much more easier but easy always doesn't mean that that's the best way <laughs> so i think what what worked best for this project we have tried so far and so far we have actually got the very good results uh, isn't it josephine i, th I think uh, that that is my feeling so far and actually Honestly, we have got so much done like this. What 
you know that's also something very interesting the the times that we have spent together when has been very productive times regarding to music and uh, the the text yeah i i agree i think it's been a I think it's been a really um, the, the fact that we've worked the fact that we've we've worked in these in these moments of time like this spread out uh, helps that I think it gives us space and that space to understand the, wh where we want to go next and come back together um, partly because of lockdown has made that happen you know like it's really spread out the process for us because of the pandemic um, and, and, and when we've actually been able to be together in these times and we've been like all three times we've been together has been during lockdown right so each time it's been so amazing to be in the room together that we've just got this incredible collaborative spirit because everyone is just delighted to be together making work again so i think that's really informed and infused our work is just the joy of being able to make work to, you know be in a room and create um but also i think it's it's really testimony to um the people that who with who were, who were there with us so i think marie if you're just so open uh, to the idea of encountering new artists and being open to new ideas so that you know when samira was with us in in uh, july and samira's that was playing was exploring our dido she's from algeria and she brought this berber song and suddenly dido kind of appeared for us in the room and the reason why she appeared so powerfully was because I think you gave her the space to kind of take Hattie's lyrics and play with them and not necessarily immediately start something that we'd already written for her it was not that bit spirit and that's partly because of your openness and it's partly because Hattie really responds to being in the space you know Hattie's very she's a responsive writer she's not she like you doesn't she doesn't I think she can sit in her bedroom and write, but that's not the way that she wants to work. And it's certainly not the way she wants to work with this piece. So it's the, it's the three of us absolutely searching for, 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 for a voice together, a way of working together, which embraces all of these other voices, which I think is really at the heart of, 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 and true to the idea of being out of tune. You know, we're not, we don't have all the answers yet and we've, we've searched for them together. I did go away and talk to Shadi Bart. Shadi is an author and classicist who translated the version of the Aeneid that Josephine Maroof used to read and understand the text. So we used your translation of the Aeneid um, for, for Dido's Bar. We want to sort of set the scene really for why it was such a relevant piece of text to use, why it's still relevant now. And, and, um, and I guess I wanted to ask you sort of why you were drawn to it as a, as a text to, to translate. Hmm. Thanks for the question. I was drawn to it because it's an incredibly complex piece of writing that has to do several balancing jobs at the same time. On the one hand, it's a, Re a Roman response to the great Homeric Greek epics, an attempt to rival Greece by creating a, a rival national literature. And on the other hand, it's also a political document, um, possibly written at the urging of the Emperor Augustus, but in any case, looking back to the foundation of what would eventually become the city the author was living in, namely ancient Rome. Um, and these are kind of two very different angles of the poetic and the political here. And then um, as you read the poem, more and more complexities um, come to light that really invite reflection on all sorts of things, whether it's um, the, the role of rhetoric in wartime self-representation or the treatment of women in the ancient world and the, the suggestion that they weren't credible ever um, to issues that arise with settlement and colonies and refugees that are basically unsolvable. It seemed to me to speak to the present in so many ways and at the same time to be kind of um, bottomlessly f uh, f fantastic and thoughtful on its own. That's an incredible introduction. Thank you. When you speak about about women and about how women aren't credible, I think you said. Can you speak a little bit about that? I think this comes out most clearly in the Dido episode, although Virgil also refers to it at several other points. And um, what I want to make it clear that I don't think that Virgil is silencing, as it were, the females of the epic. Instead, he is showing us how they are silenced. Um, and in order to show us that, 
he um, will make it obvious, for example, that a woman is speaking the truth in a particular case, only to have her discounted by some of the other figures in the narrative. So, for example, when Dido um, accuses Aeneas of trying to sneak away, we know that he was trying to sneak away. Or when he tells her that he never planned to stay with her forever, um, what Jupiter says right before that contradicts that. Jupiter is upset that Aeneas is staying at Carthage forever. And um, even the conditions of their marriage or not marriage, um, Dido has been held up as kind of the crazy girlfriend clinging to Aeneas as he sails away towards the West, etc. But in fact, uh, she has every right to believe they are married because it, this is a personal vendetta between the two goddesses, Venus and Hera. And Hera says they're married and Venus says they're not. So it's not simply a woman's feelings or a man's um, addiction to the question of duty or anything like that. These kind of stereotypes from the ancient world that did reflect how women were treated are undermined in this epic, as if Virgil wants to remind us that um, those voices are valuable. Well, exactly. And the show is called Dido's Bar. Right. We haven't called it right. Aeneas's Bar or Latinus's Bar. It's her, it's her place that he first comes to. Our show, I don't know how much you know about it actually, was inspired by Maruf, who's a musician and has traveled <laughs> to lots of different places before he found a home in, in Finland. And actually, I was going to sort of ask if you had any any thoughts on that. Latinus has this sort of, seems to have this sort of open door uh, immigration policy, but Aeneas is forced to leave his home. He is desperately looking for this for this place that he has been promised. And I was really struck by the first line that I think I mentioned it in my email to you. You translated the first line slightly differently to a few of the uh, adaptations in the past. That was a, a very conscious choice. Um, in fact, the Latin word profugus does mean a refugee, and it's different from the Latin word for exile because exiles are sent away by political uh, regimes that they used to belong to, but that, that they're no longer popular in, right? But in Aeneas's case, there is no place to go back to. He hasn't been sent away by the Trojan government, and he's not somebody who's forced to leave by the Trojan government. He leaves because there's nothing left. Troy is burnt to the ground. He has has no home. And I think uh, for refugees maybe coming from war-torn countries who've seen their homelands and cities being utterly destroyed, this might ring very uh, powerfully. So yes, but this is one of the richnesses and oddities of the poem that Aeneas, who represents the Trojan ancestry of the a uh, ruling family at Rome, Augustus, um, that he is in fact called a refugee and made to seem pitiful um, at the very first time we see him. And yet um, by the end of the poem, of course, he has um, successfully with his fellow Trojans and the help of some of the native Italians, conquered the rest of the native Italians by war and um, essentially founded a, a, Trojan, a Trojan stronghold in Italy, claiming all along it was his destiny, right? So this resonates very unpleasantly, especially with you know the American history of colonization and the um, fighting between the first peoples and the colonizers and so forth. And there's a curious reflection there on, on the nature of refugee dumb. I think an important thing to say might not, uh, might be that there's no such thing as just a refugee because the conditions they come from are so different. So here's Aeneas, a Trojan prince, a member of the royal family who eventually ends up on the shore of Dido, a Tyrian princess, and they recognize in each other this kind of, you know, we belong to mythology. And, um, and he stays there with her. But that's very different from, you know, swimming across dangerous waters with nothing except for what you've got on your back and not being a Trojan prince, right? And not believing that this is your destiny and God will help you along the way. So there are refugees and then there are refugees. And uh, it's, it's also about politics, money, nationalism, and all sorts of issues, you know. 
uh, many countries wealth, uh, welcome wealthy refugees, right? Yeah. They just don't want the poor ones. Right. And it kind of sounds like Aeneas sort of is a little bit of a villain by the end. He is a villain. <laughs> and it's fascinating that more people haven't seen this. And I think that's partly due to the fact that the very first readers of the epic said it was a, a poem that praised Augustus through Aeneas, right? So if you're set up to expect that, you're not really looking for any signs of hostility to Aeneas, as it were. However, there are a lot of problems with Aeneas. For one thing, he repeatedly lies, which we know from knowing the rest of the narrative. Um, some scholars have even suggested that he breaks a, a pact one day before the pact is over so that he can attack his Italian enemies while they're sitting unsuspecting in the Senate room. Um, he lies to Dido, as I've suggested. But maybe the most shocking thing, which again, nobody seems to have noticed, is that when he arrives in Italy, he sends one of his envoys to set up a pact with King Latinus, whose daughter he hopes to marry. And King Latinus welcomes the envoy and says, sure, I'll make a pact with your leader, Aeneas, but there's only one condition. He has to come, see me in person, and shake my hand to ratify the pact. And uh, the envoy says, oh, wonderful, fantastic, thanks, and goes away. But Aeneas never comes. In the meantime, other things happen. Other wars break out. There's skirmishes. And before you know it, there's a full-fledged battle with the with the Latins. But And the whole time, Aeneas is saying, well, they broke the pact. They broke the pact. Therefore, I should win because God's on my side. But there wasn't any pact. So imagine Virgil actually showing us this with his narrative and us not picking up on it for 2,000 years. And can I ask, you know, why do you think that is? Do you think that is, obviously, I understand why it wasn't picked up back then, but more recent translations, do you think that's because they've put the emphasis in the wrong place or they have been mostly men? <laughs> well, they're almost entirely men. Um, I, I think it's mostly because nobody has been set up with a, with a correct frame of expectations about this, mm -hmm. right? We all come to the story imagining it's a heroic epic that, that pleased Augustus because we know that August, Augustus did want something like this. And, and, and sorry, Virgil did read small parts of it to him in person, right? So it's not some kind of silly anti-imperial essay, but it does have these moments that lead you to ask by what means a hero actually conquers. You know, why did he sacrifice people alive? Why did he lie? Why did he break truces? Is this what it takes to win? And um, I don't think the male classics reading establishment has really been thinking about those kinds of questions in relationship to this epic so much. Um, simply because it's always been a very upper crust and usually politically and socially well situated group that has read it or that teaches it or has taught it up to quite recently. So maybe, you know, the audiences were just wrong and have never really been right until this moment. I don't know. <laughs> and why do you think we keep coming back to the classics then? I think there are many reasons for that. Um, one is that, and this is going to sound incredibly academic, yeah, but no. I think it's very valuable. We have in front of us um, the history of other people reading these texts, these same texts for 2,000 years. So we've got 2,000 years of people reading the same texts that we're reading now and commenting on them and saying they had meaning. And by looking at this, you can see how the meanings change drastically from culture to culture and epic to epic, each one being a sort of mirror for the culture that is producing that meaning. And it's much harder to see in our own case. But if you look back, first you can see, as I said, um, the poem being taken as a, a simplistic praise of Augustus through his Trojan ancestor, Aeneas. Then the early Christians thought it was an allegory for the life of the Christian everyman, um, with Dido, the Dido episode representing the tumultuous desires of adolescence, and Book Six representing the heights of wisdom, um, after which the allegory stops rather abruptly, since nobody knows what to do with Book Seven to Twelve, in which everybody's slaughtering each other. Um, and then it's been taken over as um, defenses of empire, or it's been it's been used to naturalize empires. For example, you know, Mussolini said that the idea of the Roman Empire was more or less, more or less an et eternal one that he was returning to. 
not so much starting under his own steam. And then um, during the Vietnam War, there were a lot of readings in the US that saw the epic as being about the, the cost and the tragedy of war um, for the victims and even for the victors. And now uh, there are readings coming out, and I'm not the first to say that um, Virgil seems to deliberately contradict himself all over the place. There have been some really great um, readings of the poem to that effect recently. Um, and now we're interested in how authority, um, how, let, let me put it this way, how art is always able to somehow slip past authority. And that's what we're showing Virgil doing. And I think, um, you know, maybe we're thinking more about, well, I, I don't know, actually, I shouldn't pontificate because I'm completely out of my depth here. But um, I'll, I'll just say that it does seem that people are so cynical about authority that they're willing to see ancient poets like Virgil um, being similarly uh, cautious around questions of, of authority and um, citizenship. Yeah, so interesting. And I and I don't think I'd really thought about it in that capacity. I think because I've been reading it through this lens of immigration and what it says about that, I have thought recently reading it about the sort of racial hatred that Aeneas experiences at the hands of at the, the Italians. Yeah, from Turnus. And so this is another fantastic question, which is um, why do the Italians say particular things about um, Aeneas? And what are they up to? And what is Virgil up to? So on the one hand, yes, they, they use kind of racial anti-Asian, at least as Asia was understood in their world, not ours, slurs, like saying that he curls his hair or that his, his, um, he wears long sleeves, or uh, he's got silk slippers, or there's too much unguent on him, these kinds of things, which are Roman uh, racial stereotypes about Asia Minor. But uh, he's also characterized by the Italians as a runaway, a traitor, a robber, the worst of all Trojans, and the person who gave up Troy to the Greeks. And scholars have often said, oh, this is just, you know, the, the rhetoric of the angry other side. But in fact, all of that harkens back to the story of Aeneas before Virgil wrote it. And a large strain in that story was about his possibly having been the person who betrayed Troy. So what, what Turnus and Amata and the other Italians are saying may in a sense be true, right? They may be treating him as the original Aeneas and not the one that Virgil has cooked up, mm -hmm. if you could wrap your brain around that sort of wacky idea. We're doing a show where, uh, you know, Aeneas is a central character and I'm not going lie he's not looking that good right now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think that the more time goes by the more we'll see him as actually a very wily lying and manipulative roman version of odysseus actually yes people still love odysseus even though uh you know more and more translations come out now that paint him to be the sort of well as you say wily you know, cunning Odysseus figure that he is. So maybe, maybe a shift is needed in our in our view of Aeneas. Absolutely. And so I think it's much more exciting to say instead of oh, Aeneas is a bit of a boring character because Virgil had to make him pious and good. To say instead of that, look at this character Aeneas. It's amazing how he represents himself as pious, and we believe it because he's called pious in the narrative. And yet, look at his dastardly actions. So why? Do we believe the authority that he's pious when with our own eyes we can see the stuff he's doing? It's a really spooky question. I feel I feel with the classics as well, there's a there's a sort of degree of separation between if you're not an academic and a scholar like you are, you do sort of take stuff at face value at what you're told a little bit more than you would perhaps interrogate a more recent text. I think that's true. And I think that's one of the great things about the humanities that um, it gives you these skills to you know, think critically about language and what you're told in literature. And um, since we communicate in language all the time, um, I, I think there are takeaways there um, for society in general and that we shouldn't be so poo-poo about the value of literature. This poem is about many of the issues we face today and have always faced as a society, relationship between the sexes, um, the, the, the question of whether power is meted out justly, 
um, the um, the role of ideology and nationalism, uh, the power of labels like fugitive or um, refugee, and and so forth. So to me, it seems like there's no way of saying it's not relevant to us. You know, it's it's worth thinking. It's for us to take and think with. Thank you so so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, and thanks for the great questions. pleasure of being in the room for a Dido's Bar Research and Development Week in December 2020. And Maruf, you were playing Aeneas then, um, which makes sense. But having just finished this festival, summer 2021, does it feel different now? How much do you identify with this quite complicated character of Aeneas? You know, that's a very good question because the, that is something that we have discussed uh, quite a lot with Josephine as well. He, he's been, let's say, he's been someone that I, I, I have been very much thinking about his journey, the way how he has done things. And uh, even, even I think that unconsciously I have took him with me also out of this project, not, not only in Dido's Bar or, or out of tune project, but also in my own works, I have uh, unconsciously, I have realized this uh, person uh, has been with me quite a lot. He's actually a very interesting character in many ways. So I don't know if I can identify with him in every ways, you know, but in some ways I I also have, you know, there are some, some stuff that I also see in myself, you know, what, what is he doing for his, his nation and how he is looking at the future and how, how he is ready to, you know, to let go of many things that he loves and he wants just because of the purpose that he has. So, but he has a very contradictory uh, personality, you know. And especially if you bring him to, to, this, age, to this era where we live, that makes him a bit uh, not really lovable person, but uh, I can't imagine somebody like him how 1,000 years ago or in old time how he has been. So I can, I, let's shortly say, I, I really, I can appreciate him as a person in many ways, not in every way, but in many ways. I guess part of adapting this story, of adapting the Aeneid as a whole, is also about adapting Aeneas himself and focusing, on just, and focusing on different aspects of his personality and his journey. Um, certainly there's less violence. And instead, would you say that conflict works itself out through music? Definitely. I mean... <laughs> That's uh, that's going without without saying yes, and uh, but uh, I was you know what I have understood from the from epics is that uh, not necessarily everything that we are saying in the epics are what we are saying. So uh, it might be that sometimes they're talking about fights and killing and swords and you know blood and this stuff but many of those things are, i think there are symbolic things you know this is how i you know how usually i try to get close to the to the old texts so i think many of those images where they're bringing it's because people in that time maybe could more easily relate it to those things, to the fights and to the to the knights and you know to the sword. So rather than a soft person who plays the instruments and goes into the village and tells the stories, so I think that that might be more the things. He is not necessarily a, a very violent person, even though in some part of the books, especially at the end, you know shows up that yeah he's quite violent but there's also parts that you can see that he's not really violent person but we we will make him a, an artist a super soft 
artist. Yeah, I, I think he, he might not be totally super soft because I think there's a f- harshness in him that will have to come out at some point. But I but I know, I, I hear what Maru's saying. And obviously we've, we've definitely been thinking about different kinds of instruments, right? I mean, there's like, I think it is the beginning of the book, which says something like, I can't even remember the Latin, but it's something about weapons and a man. I'm going to sing of a weapons and a man is like the first line of the, sh- of, the, of the book. And we've definitely thought about like, well, can we say instruments and a man? Like, you know, like, because in some ways it's a different kind of an instrument of war or song or music. We have had long stories, Maruf and I, about long conversations about whether he will be Aeneas and can we find someone to play Aeneas who who has so much of the musical quality of of Maruf and the kind of sensibility and the story. And we've had we've had we've had the privilege of working with a few people who over the last couple of months who we had a wonderful Finnish actor who who was exploring Aeneas with us in in um in Finland. And we will uh, in London we're gonna this autumn we're going to hear a little bit of the text read by the Syrian actor who joined us in in Cove Park in Scotland in 2020. So we're going to keep exploring the voice of Aeneas and who can possibly bring Maruf's qualities to the story. Thank you. Yeah, that that actually brings me really nicely to to a final question, really. What do you want to achieve with the piece? What do you want to say with it? And what do you think people are going to take away from it? The subject that we uh working around and working with is uh something which is going on and and it has been going on in uh, in the world and in Europe for quite a time you know moving immigration uh adapting to a new place you know the challenging of becoming a, a citizen of a new place regardless of the language and the culture you know everywhere people can relate to so I think the, those are what we, we aim for and uh, we have aimed for from the very beginning. Aside from that main aim of just wanting to create an extraordinary piece of work, I really would love people to um, have the opportunity to encounter stories like Maruf's story and many, many other stories and, and have a slightly more of a deeper insight into their experiences and the journeys with which people go to to, to reach Europe. And um, it is an epic story, this story of the Aeneid. It is an extraordinary, timeless story and finding ways to retell that story and enable other people to encounter it, the myth of Aeneas and the journey to Europe and their great love affair with Dido and the experience of trying to establish and assimilate in a, in a new place told in quite a different way that that I really am excited to share that story with people so it's I guess the layers of an extraordinary piece of work which is shown in an interesting creative fun way in this bar surrounded by music and theatre the opportunity to hear the stories of migration told personally and powerfully and universally and um, the opportunity to re-encounter an old story in, with contemporary resonance. The process has shown me that it is possible to work towards a show that, that tries to achieve those aims because they're all wrapped into Dido's Bar. This is just the beginning for Dido's Bar, which will be coming your way next year. In the meantime, stay tuned for more podcast episodes exploring the music behind Dido's Bar and our other Dash projects. Thank you to Josephine Burton, Maruf Medigi, Liv Albert and Shadi Barch. I'm Rachel Head, and if you like the Dash Arts podcast, please do like and subscribe. It means the world to us. See you next time. Pomegranates. Sugar. Cardamom. Dried limes. Saffron. Cilantro. Fenugreek. At boost. Garlic cloves. Rice petals. Saffron. Thyme. Coreshed corn and salsa. Coreshed ekaras. Coreshed barimyan. Coreshed fesenyan. Coreshed game. Yeah.
Kumar Kapal.